We're going to talk about cities of refuge. Remember one of the things we're doing today is we are expanding on the vision of God for the house. Amen. Now the principles will apply to anyone who listens and receives them. But this is what God is saying is for C and C. And we're called to be a city of refuge. God provides a refuge. What does that indicate? That indicates I need one. I know I have an acute grasp of the obvious. But God would not provide what I don't need. And there are many in the body of Christ who need a city of refuge. There are many who have been wounded in the body of Christ and cannot find a place for healing. Because everywhere they go, they're re-wounded. God is looking to provide and develop some place, some safe places in the earth and in the body of Christ. God in this hour is bringing us into a new land, also called the promised land. Now catch this, folks. You have promises of God. And God wants to bring you into your promised land. But he also wants to bring the corporate body into the promised land. The land of the fulfillment of all the promises of God. Amen. Now here's what I'd like. I'd like for God to just give it to me. I'm not receiving anything. What's wrong? Because everything they got, they got by war. God is changing our mentality. From a welfare mentality. See, in the wilderness, he changed it from a slave mentality. But we picked up a welfare mentality. Because every morning I went out and got manna. And once in a while I went out and got quail. Sister Debbie was uh, doing some transplanting out there this morning. And I went out to talk to her. She asked me this question which I never thought of, and Scripture doesn't speak to, okay? What did they do with the animals in the wilderness? Wasn't a whole lot of grass for the sheep, was it? I wonder if the sheep ate manna. I wonder if the cattle ate manna. The main purpose for the cattle and the sheep in the wilderness was to offer sacrifice. Because when... Moses spoke to Pharaoh. He said, we need to go and sacrifice in the wilderness. Oh, you mean the wilderness is a place to sacrifice. Well, moving right along. (laughs) See, we don't think it through, do we? God wants to get us into a mindset and out of the welfare mindset into a warfare man's mindset. Now, let me say this. There are some who have only a warfare mindset. If you have only a warfare mindset, you may be called a warfare, but you've got to be balanced out. Because you cannot possess the land by just warfare. You can get it, but you can't keep it. You keep it by cultivation, by... uh, Clearing out the homes. Remember, you're getting homes that you didn't work for, that you didn't build. You're getting orchards that weren't yours. These all have spiritual parallels, which maybe someday we'll get to teach them. Okay? I just want to whet your appetite, get you hungry. Okay? Now, It is the land or the season where the promises of God to us individually and corporately will be fulfilled. He is not coming until the promises He's given are fulfilled. Well, I won't go on that one either. This land is spiritual geography with rivers, mountains, wildernesses, and cities. Now just let me drop this on you. I know most of you probably heard of the Seven Mountain Teaching. But one day the Lord said to me, I want you to speak on the Seven Mountains. I said, Lord, I have a struggle with the Seven Mountain Message. 
He said, I didn't say those mountains. He said, I visited, I had seven mountain experiences in my walk here on earth. Go to those. How many know I got a wake up call? Okay? See, I, what, what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing, I have to find in the life of Christ. If I can't find it there, I need to eliminate the thought and let God redo, rework it if it needs reworking. Seven mountain experiences of Jesus. The seven rivers that flow out of your innermost being. Amen. Out of your innermost being shall flow. Rivers. Plural. Yes. What are they? You ever thought of it? Have you asked the Lord what ones flow, flow, are to flow out of you? Have you asked the Lord what needs to be removed so they can flow clearly and abundantly? He's going to bring a people that out of their innermost being flow rivers, not trickle streams. <clears throat> oh, my, my, my. God is revealing the character and nature of these geographical places <clears throat> in the spiritual promised land. They are spiritual realities God wants to work into our local gatherings and He is creating for us and in us. Remember, we are His promised land. Let me say that again. We are Jesus' promised land, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame. Why? Because He had a joy. You are the joy set before Jesus. Many existing structures he's repurposing. I remember driving down the, uh, to my home one day when I was still in Canada. And I saw this building over on the right hand side and it was jacked up and they were putting a foundation under it. It had not had a foundation originally. He said, I'm going to cause you to do that in the spirit in many places that I take you. Laying a foundation where things were built on the sand. Go in and dig deep and find the rock. Listen, there's some structures out there, spiritual structures, that God wanted built. But they weren't built properly because they weren't founded on the rock. Oh, by the way, did you notice that scripture in Luke says, He digs deep? How many recognize God still working to find the foundation in you? He's still digging. Doesn't mean your structure's wrong. It just means you need a foundation that will not shake in the days to come. And if he wasn't digging, the rock wouldn't be in there. Hallelujah. See, the rock's inside, not external. No, I'm not flying. All right. This is the type of Israel conquering the cities of Canaan, then cleansing and inhabiting them. There are some spiritual structures he wants to lift up and put a proper foundation under and then renovate it. Okay? So don't give up on any of the church structures out there. He's not finished with any of his church yet. Okay? The types and shadows of spiritual realities are found in the study of Israel conquering and settling the land of promise. Conquering first. We never thought of having to conquer our promised land, did we? That changes the whole theological base. The promised land is inhabited with squatters. How many know squatters live there, but they don't belong there? Right. And squatters don't like to leave because they say possession is nine-tenths of the law. The progressive possessing of our inheritance. God revealed the method by which he would cause them to inherit. Now notice this. He says, I will. There's a number of I wills. Okay? Things that only God can do. I'm thankful we have God and we never possess anything. Amen. 
We might even be possessed by the end of it. No. Um, I will send my fear before thee, and I will destroy all the people to whom thou art come. Now the mentality of the current church is, I'm not going to have to fight for it. God said he'd do it. They sing the old hymn, Jesus paid it all, I don't have to do anything. But see, there's a he will, and there's something I must do. Again, I guess I took my little balance beam off there, but I have this balance beam that I put on the front when I teach. Because we must learn the balance of God in all things. He said, I will make all thine enemies turn their back unto thee, and I will send hornets before thee, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canite, and the Hittite from before thee. I will not drive them out before thee in one year, or in one deliverance. Lest the land become desolate, and the beasts of the field multiply against thee. By little and little I will drive them out from before thee. By little and little I will drive them out from before thee until thou be, until thou be increased. Until thou be increased. God wants to increase you. Until thou be increased and inherit the land. There's got to be an increase before inheritance. Okay? And I will, I will set thy bounds. I want to set my own bounds. I want, I want, I want to grow up. I don't want to grow up. Isn't there a song out there? One of the Disney movies, I don't want to grow up. Oh. <clears throat> you know, there are many, many Christians singing that song. The call of this house is to grow up into Him in all things. I will set thy bounds from the Red Sea even under the Sea of the Philistines and from the desert under the river. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land catch this into your hand. Oh, you mean I've got something to do in this. And thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt drive them out before thee. That's my responsibility. He delivers them, but I got to drive them out. In other words, it's my choice. God never takes away from you your choice. The process by which the promised inheritance is obtained or possessed. I'll generate in them my fear. That is a sovereign work of God. Two, I will destroy all the squatters. This is God's heart for the battles. To destroy the squatters. Not just remove them, destroy them. If I destroy them, they can't come back. This had to be an internally, an internal as well as an external, because they fought valiantly to keep what they were squatted on. Didn't they? We don't think those types and shadows through, do we? Okay. I will cause the enemy to turn their back to you and run from you. This was not immediate, but after a period of fighting and God working on the hearts with his fear and even possibly the sting portion of the operation. God has a sting operation. It's called hornets. I will send hornets. I will send difficulties or hornets that will make them want to leave the land. Number five, I will, it will take a while to drive them out, partially because of the process of learning to settle a land and inhabit it. Remember, they had not owned land for 400, over 400 years. Those skills had been lost. They had to be restored. And God is restoring some things to the church that have been lost Amen. since the early church. We are in the middle of being restored, <coughs> renovated. There was no chorus we used to sing in Christian community. It, let's see if I can remember. 
You can renovate, you can redecorate, you can even move the furniture. God is out to change me. Not because he hates me, but because he loves me and wants to live with me and in me forever. Remember that their DNA had been changed to slave DNA in Egypt. None of their family had ever owned land for generations. The wilderness worked the slave mentality out of them, out of them possessing worked a warrior mentality into them, as well as a welfare mentality out of them. What's going on in the world today? Is there a welfare mentality arising? What's going on in the church today? I have a right to be healed. I have a right to this. I have a right to that. That's a welfare mentality. Everything you get from God comes out of your relationship with Him. And God is drawing you into Him. You know, sometimes He piques your curiosity in the Word or He piques your curiosity through teaching and He ignites hunger within you. And He said, They that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall. That word shall means it's impossible for it not to happen. What a powerful promise of God. Okay? Inheriting was to convince them of the faithfulness of God. Dare we say that most of this generation of Christians have been slaves to some type of system and not love slaves to the Lord Himself. He is changing that. In Galatians 4 and 3, it says this in this translation, the MLB uh, 2020 translation. So also when we were infants, having been enslaved under the elements, elemental principles of the world. The VLB translation says, so also when we were children, we were held in bondage under the principles of the world. Do you realize that he, although they were brought out of Egypt, Egypt held an Egypt, Egyptian mentality yeah. held them enslaved in the wilderness. Yeah. Yeah. Many people have come out of the world, but God wants to get the world out of the people. Amen. 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 So there are two other versions there. Um, both talk about the principles of the world or the basic principles of the world system. Many of our churches are still operated by the principles of the world system. God is setting us free from that. Now if God were to give them the land all at once, then the following would be the pitfalls. One, the land would become desolate. It's never God's desire for a land to become desolate. If he's called you to inhabit it, if he's called you to possess it, then he wants to see it bring forth much fruit. And he's going to use you to do it. Second of all, too much land would be cleared by driving out the inhabitants and it would be a greater task than the Israelites could accomplish to reclaim the land in one year. God, why don't you take that thing out of me, all of it? Because you couldn't handle it. You've got to grow into the ability. You know, most of us are old enough here and we've had children. And some days we bless them and some days we weren't too sure. Right? And they all grow at different speeds. We had six teenagers in the house at once. I earned every one of these. <laughs> I remember talking to an old pastor 
well, he was older now. And he said, uh, I said to him, you know, when I had my children, I didn't know how to be a father. And he responded this way, and the children taught you how to be a father. Sometimes we forget that. When God brings us into something, it's because He wants to teach us something. Not because He's mad at us. Not because we sinned. Not because we disobeyed. But because He wants to teach us His ways. So He said, I'm not going to drive them all out in one swap. The wild beasts would multiply beyond what could be handled or tamed. Of course, you don't have wild beasts in you, do you? You never fly off the handle. Some days you can't even find the handle. <laughs> God wants to grow us up. And with our children, if we taught them right, they, when they got to responsibility, they could handle it. And... How many know the Bible calls us the children of God? Yes. But we never draw the parable. Mm -hmm. It's God that calls us babes. Doesn't mean we're good looking, it's just He calls us babes. <laughs> it's God that calls us children. It's God that calls us young men and God that calls us fathers. They're stages of growth. And God wants us to grow up into Him in all things. So in every stage of our life, in every area that He has created something in us, He wants us to come to maturity in that area. The thing in God is you can be at one level of maturity in one area and immature in the other. That's what confuses the church. That's what confuses us. Because we've never drawn the parallel between natural children and bringing them up and bringing up spiritual children. God said He would drive the inhabitants out little by little. This speaks of a process and taking time, not an instant deliverance. Let me say that again, because we have been brought up on the microwave Christianity. And they tell me, that microwaving takes something out of the food. Doesn't put anything in. Oh yeah, it's quick. Oh yes. Sometimes it takes what you need out of it and all you get is filler. <coughs> you know, like junk. Alright. Number one, drive out some inhabitants. This is the process. I call it an ascending spiral to full victory and inheritance. Or is it the ascending Mount Zion from Psalm 24, verse 3. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Ascending, to, they had to clear the mountain of the inhabitants first before they could inhabit the mountain. So drive out some of the inhabitants. Second of all, an increase increasing of a revelation of God and of God himself in the Israelites. There is an increase that God wants to do in you of himself. That's what much of your, what you're going through is to, to do. When God begins to dig in you, it's not because you've done something wrong. It's because he wants to put more of himself in you. Amen. Hallelujah. Three, an inheriting of the land. This is more than just name it and claim it. My but got quiet in a hurry. <laughs> inheriting includes claiming the land that's mine. Inheriting means cleansing the land that God gives me. Oh, you mean he doesn't do that? You mean I've got to do that? It's not necessarily dirt-free, idol-free, demon-free, just because God says He's giving it to me. In fact, it's full of all those things. Okay? Well, whether it's okay or not, it's true. All right. <laughs> Inheriting would include fixing the property, planting the crops, 
and bringing in the first harvest from it. Because when you take the harvest from it, then it's your land. And that process is for every promise God has given you. That process is for every promise God has given the local assemblies that He has established. Remember there were tribe, 12 tribes in Israel, not one. We talked yesterday that God is going to restore to natural Israel the quote lost tribes, but He's also going to restore to the church the lost tribes. Why? Because God is speaking naturally and spiritually. It's not one or the other. I'm looking for some interesting things to happen in natural Israel. And when I see them, I'm going to declare what they mean prophetically here. Because we are called to be the Israel of God. Therefore, what God, first that which is natural, what's the rest of that scripture? Then that which is spiritual. So keep your eye on Israel. They're a prophetic sign. Now inheriting would include fixing the property, planting the crops, and bringing in the first harvest. God sets my boundaries, not me. I felt to emphasize this because the world's trying to do away with all boundaries. The boundaries between countries the boundaries between sexes, the boundaries between law and injustice, all, they're trying to do away with all the boundaries. God said, no, no, I set the boundaries, Amen. not man. There are certain things God reserves for himself. That's because he's all wise. Because <laughs> if we had the boundaries, we would go for places that God hasn't called us to go. Amen. This means I need to know what territory he's giving me and both the geography of it and those inhabitants that I am to drive out of it. I will not have the grace or authority to take on anything beyond the boundaries of my promise. Let me say that again. I will not have the grace or authority to take on anything beyond the boundaries of my promise. Consider this. When conquering the promised land, Israel's armies had to take the cities. God declared that the priesthood of Levi, Aaron's tribe, would have 48 cities for their inheritance. Now remember yesterday, if you were here, I taught on the prophetic promises from, uh, of Jacob in Genesis 49. And I don't care, everything I do bleeds one into the other. So, we're, we're going to have to realize that God said of Israel, or of Levi, I'm going to scatter them in the inheritance. But listen to this. They were given no specific territory with borders, but like leaven and dough, they were scattered throughout the whole nation in all the tribes. Why? To remind the tribes that God was their inheritance. God scattered them. Negatively, it was a curse. You're going to be scattered. But positively, God, in every tribe, there was a manifestation of God's hand. Because this, the 48 cities were in all the tribes. God is never left without a witness. If you study church history, you'll find that even in the darkest of ages, there were people who were baptized in the Spirit, speaking in tongues, moving in the gifts. They were the minority, but there's always been a light. Of these 48 cities, there were set aside six cities as cities of refuge. The natural importance of those cities for the nation is vital to understanding as well the types and shadows surrounding them. All of them have spiritual significance. And there's a map laying out the 48 cities. Interesting. But there are characteristics of the city of refuge that are important. Each one had to be easily accessible to the Israelites in the area. A city of refuge has to be accessible. 
It can't be in a difficult road. Okay? Please hear that. Cities of refuge were always Levitical cities or cities with a strong presence of a focus on God, His purposes, His mercy, His grace, His justice, not social justice. There are those who are interpret, interpreting God's scriptures on justice as social justice. Listen, man cannot be just unless God is working in it. Amen. The length of their ability to protect the refugee <coughs> was the lifespan of the high priest under whose tenure the offense they were accused of was committed. How many know our high priest is going to die? Oh, catch the significance of that. Our high priest is not going to die. Therefore, there is permanent refuge, permanent Forgiveness, permanent work done in his people. Go back to one of my favorite scriptures. We keep talking about it, especially when I'm doing Torah. 1 Corinthians 10 11. Now all these things happen unto them for examples or examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the age are come. The marginal rendering in one of my Bibles years ago said they are examples of us on whom the ends of the age are come. You mean we're going to be like those children of Israel? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. yeah, we are. That's why we need Jesus. Only He can change our character and nature. God is not into behavior modification. You know, we worship an idol called Christian. A Christian doesn't do this, a Christian doesn't do that, a Christian does this, a Christian does that. And they may be true, those things may be true. But if we worship that, and the, if we worship the image and not Jesus, then Jesus cannot appear to us in another form. Amen. In the study of natural Israel in the Old Testament or the Old Covenant, all the natural tendencies of human nature are, are examples, as well as God's responses and enablements to overcome those tendencies. Thank God. Okay? Why? Because He's using those same principles on us to change us, to change our character, to change our nature. It's going to take the same level of intervention. Because he's the same in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and in the Millennial Age. Yesterday, today, and forever. The local gathering of believers should be the safest place in the area for those who are babies in any area of the Spirit to be formed, shaped, and developed, as well as for growth. That's what God wants to make of this house. A safe place. In our teaching, we've often likened it to a womb, and I often say it's a womb without a view. That was bad. But it's fun. <laughs> don't you sometimes feel like you don't really are not really able to see what's going on? Or understand? And it might be because in that particular area of your life, God has you in a womb. Because he's still working and developing. Remember in Psalm 139, he formed you in the womb. He said to Jeremiah 1 and 10, he said, before I, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you and called you to be a prophet to the nations. Yes, right. Amen. God's been spending a long time thinking about you. Oh my, my. You'll get that someday. <laughs> when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. Oh, he knew me, and he loved me. He whose glory makes 
the heavens shine so unworthy of God's mercy when he was on the cross I was on his mind God get that way down deep inside yes. it will deal with rejection it will deal with abandonment because it predates all that experience in your life. The natural woman has been created by God to be the safest place to form and shape and develop a child. On the, on the onset of abortion in the natural is a prophetic warning to the church. Its prevalence should alert God's leadership of the attempts of the enemy to abort God's purposes in individuals, in local gatherings, and in the church worldwide. There are three times in, in the scriptures when there has been an attack on the children. In Moses' day, what were they going? They are going for all the boy babies. In Jesus' time, what was happening? They were going for all the children in Bethlehem. In the end time. Why are they doing that? Because the enemy thinks that he can abort God's purpose in a people. How do I know it's the end time? Because of abortion. It's a sign of the end of the age. A prophetic sign that most folks haven't gotten hold of. But if in Moses' time, when God was instituting a whole new plan, if it happened then, and if it happened when the Lord Jesus was here, because God was instituting a new plan, as God gets ready to institute a new plan for the next age, we have the same sign. Today many churches are not safe places for men and women to have their inner man shaped and formed. If we are to participate in the large and gathering God's getting ready to release, it's imperative that our gatherings become safe and not abortion centers. Amen. Spiritual abortion centers are place, places where the plan of God for a life is aborted by the interference of man's ways, machinations, Manipulations and methods. Further, cities of refuge in the natural were places where those who had accidentally caused death could run and be safe from the avenger and accuser. God is looking to develop safe places. Those places that are called of God to be cities of refuge in the Spirit are places where God will set a special dispensation of the focus of His presence, His mercy, His grace, and the priesthood or ministry that will be safe places from the avenger or the destroyer, Satan. Yes, amen. Some people need a safe place to heal. God make CMC one of those places. The refugee could live safe within the city until the death of the high priest in Israel. Then he was free to return to his land without fear of reprisal. Our high priest ever living. But not only that, God wants you to have your inheritance. Do you realize that he is my inheritance? The person of Jesus is my inheritance. I get all the extra stuff because I have the person. Stop focusing on the extra stuff and focus on the person and you'll have it all. How about a spiritual application? One of God's calls on CMC is to become a city of refuge. There are numerous applications of this, but let me take one that's dear to my heart. There are men and women who've been in the ministry in the past. 
They're called of God. They were anointed. And God's dealing with them to be restored. But they can't find a safe place. Preach. Preach. Amen. That safe place needs to be a place with love. Because love covers. It does not expose. It leads the undercover work to the Holy Spirit to convict of sin and of righteousness and judgment to come. Right. It's not that these do not have problems, but they need a safe place to deal with their problems. Yes. Amen. I remember when God was filling the Roman Catholics with the baptism of the Spirit, I told him he couldn't do it. <laughs> because i have been taught that they were the Antichrist. They were Babylon. They were the beast. You know, he didn't even answer me. <laughs> he said, if I'm filling them with the Holy Spirit, it's time for you to move on. Oh, wow. Or grow up. How I many know he's well able to do what he said? Let's leave that work to him. And let's provide a place where he can do it. The safe place. The Talmud states that the roads to these cities were not only marked by signposts saying refuge, but the roads were twice the regulation width and were particularly smooth and even in order that fugitives were as unhindered as possible as they fled to the refuge. Oh God. Oh God. Do that in your church today. Remember, they were running for their life. Part of the call on the priesthood of the ministry is to maintain the paths of God. Psalm 25 verse 10 talks about the paths of God being mercy and truth. A balance between mercy and truth. Too often we come heavy on the truth side. But we need a revelation of the mercy of God. I'm thinking that there are going to be some people in heaven that I sh thought shouldn't be there. Because their heart was right with God and their actions weren't necessarily all in place yet. Let's let him be the judge. Romans 11:29. For the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. The Apostolic Bible Polyglot says for, the irre for irrevocable are the favors and callings of God. A faithful version says, because the gifts and the callings of God are never revoked. The Passion Translation, when God chooses someone and graciously imparts a gift to him, they are never rescinded. I remember when I went through my divorce, I had been taught that divorce disqualifies you from ministry. So I handed in resignations to everyone I was involved with. And I was ready to sit down. Now I wasn't happy to sit down. Because I, I, I agree with Chuck Swindoll. He says if you can be happy doing anything else but ministry, you're not called to it. But one day my wife said to me, would you find some place to minister? You're miserable to live with. That is when I knew I was called. All right. <laughs> Here's an interesting application of Isaiah 58 and 12. And they that be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. Thou shalt be called a repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. Is it possible that this could apply to God using a people to restore apostolic and prophetic foundational relationship ministry? I don't know about you, but I know the truth concerning apostolic ministry to be restored and prophetic ministry, but I'm not sure the persons are restored. Ephesians 2 and 20 says, And you are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. 
This would suggest that at one point the foundation has been destroyed. Psalm 11 and 3 says, if the foundation be destroyed, or let's apply this, if the apostolic and prophetic ministry be destroyed, what can the righteous do? You know, Jesus talked to the woman at the well, and during that scenario, probably while he was still talking to him, the Samaritans were coming over the hill when he said, the harvest is ripe and the laborers are few. And one commentary says that the Samaritans in that city all wore white turbans. How come he didn't say that of Israel? Why was it the Samaritans? Because God is out to deal with the rejected. Weren't they rejected? They were considered half-breeds, and technically, they were half-breeds. But it's interesting that the first evangelist you see in Scripture is a Samaritan woman who'd been married at least five times. I don't think she killed her husbands. I think you'd be in jail for murder if you killed your five of your husbands. But she'd been through a divorce. Jesus didn't say, now go home and straighten up your life, and then you can preach my message. Hello? He took her as she was, and flowing in the ministry, or doing that, having the privilege of doing that, cleaned her up. Sometimes, People aren't going to get cleaned up until they begin to move and flow in God and the power of God and the Word of God begins to flow through them and cleanse them. It does a work in them. One day the Lord said to me, Bill, while my power flows through you, while my Word flows through you, let it do a work to you. And I've never been the same since. Thank God, I think I'm changing daily. God needs a safe house where his, this type of ministry can be done. It requires a people who know how to love without strings. It requires a people who trust the Holy Spirit to discipline God's servants. Romans 14, 4 says, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? For to his own master he standeth and fall. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. John 16, 7 and 8. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin. Not just the world the world in me of sin and of righteousness and judgment to come. You know, when God finally got this scripture to me, it took away all my preaching material. Because I was a closed line preacher. And by the way, you can always tell when someone doesn't have a right grip on it. They become legalistic. And we always pick on the women first when we're legalistic. Women can't do this. they got to wear this. You know, guys can have short sleeves, but I was brought up in a church where the women had to have their wrists covered and, you know, their head covered and their everything covered. Because it was legalistic. And we have got to get every bit of legalism out of us. God is going to do that. So that we trust the Holy Spirit to do what He said He can do. And when we do, we're going to see a much deeper work done than what we could have done anyway. Amen. Now as we're willing to let God bring us to a place where He can use this house to be a house of restoration, there are multiple thousands of those called to the fivefold ministry who've been wounded and cast, to, cast beside the road. Many have been driven away from the church by other leaders, and some are infected by sheep bite. (laughs) 
God the Restorer is looking for good Samaritans, innkeepers and inns, cities of refuge, where he can use and trust to care for those who've fallen among thieves. This means they were robbed, beaten, and left for half dead. Isaiah 42 and 22. But this is a people robbed and spoiled. They are all of them snared in holes, and they are hid in prison houses. They are for a prey, and none delivereth, for a spoil, and none saith restore. The parable of the Good Samaritan is the illustration of this. Then, this morning as I was going through the notes, the Lord brought this in my spirit. Restoration is a corporate work. It takes the city. We have tried as individuals to see people restored, but they don't have the context that's safe for to be restored. God is changing that in these days. And He's calling places to be cities of refuge. Joel 20 or 2, 25 and 27. And I will restore. I will. I promise. I will restore the ears that the locusts that eat the camper, canker worm, the caterpillar, the pommel worm, my great army which I sent among you. And you shall eat in plenty. And be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall catch that. If I will give myself to what God is doing, the people, I will never be ashamed. It doesn't say people won't be ashamed of me. It doesn't say people won't try and heap shame on me. But it says I will never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people, he reiterates it, shall never, never let's say it together, shall never be ashamed. Lord, re release the shame from off your people. We refuse the shame. So here's our challenge for this week. Are we going to declare restoration? Yes. Are we willing to get off our own donkey, hobby horse, spiritual conveyance, to stop and help these ministries that have fallen among thieves? Will we ask the Lord to teach us how to pour in the oil and the wine to facilitate healing? The, the oil is the anointing. In other words, we've got to have a big vat in the house. The anointing has to be flowing so that when people come in, they feel it penetrate their wounds. Yes. And their scabs. You know what scabs are, don't you? Yes. A hard spot because of wounds. Yes. Yes. You ever come up against an abrasive person? No matter what you say, <coughs> you know they're probably wounded and you're hitting in the scabs. I remember being in a meeting and we were, we'd finished the, the teaching and I said, well, let's take a break and then we'll minister to people. So we had coffee and donuts, you know, good Baptist folk we are. And uh, then we set the chair in the middle and I said, who wants to be first? And this lady sat in the chair. And I, it took my breath away because I saw her as a leper, totally scabbed. And the Lord said, you can't pray for healing, but you can put her in a vat of oil. <laughs> because in order for the healing to happen, the scabs have to be removed, and the scabs need to be soaked off by the oil. So that's what I prayed. People looked at me like I had gone crazy. Well, I am anyway. So anyway... <laughs> Are we willing to learn how to bind up the wounded? Will we go out of our way to become a safe place and develop a healing and restoration culture in the house? 
Will we be willing to give our resources so that this can be a place of respite and healing for our fallen brothers and sisters? Remember the Good Samaritan paid for the healing of the one fallen among thieves. Are we willing for this to be an inn where ministry can rest and be healed without being required to minister? Now there's much more we could challenge with, but this is what the Spirit is saying to the church here today. So I just want to say this before we pray. We have a couple of announcements that we want to give after we pray, but we need to seal this in prayer. Because I realize there's a lot of material here. By the way, I have a few notes if anybody wants any, and we can make more. Okay. But this is what we need to pray into for this house. This is God's call on this house. Or one of the aspects of it. We'll develop some of this further as we go along. But folks, God has a tremendous call on this house. Amen. And I want to see it fulfilled. In my lifetime. All right? Which means we've got, let's see, I'm 75 and we're going to live to 120. (laughs) 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 All right, let's pray. Father, as we listen for your heart, would you give us a redeeming attitude? Work in our hearts a desire to express your mercy as depicted in the city's refuge. Our heart aches for those who have fallen among thieves. Would you put upon this people the heart to see the wounded healed? We recognize there's a risk, but give us the discernment necessary to be able to navigate through those dangers. We do not want the attitude of the scribe or the Pharisee in the parable. Work in our hearts and give us understanding of what you have challenged us with today, I pray. In Jesus' name. Father, I ask that you seal this word covered over with good earth. And Father, would you also take that which each one individually is called to express of this. Because we're not each called to do the whole thing. But would you, would you witness to our spirit what is ours. And give us the ability to remember it and to pray into it and see it happen in our own lives and then be able to communicate it to others. And create that atmosphere of restoration and healing in the house, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Sister Sandra, you, you have an announcement, I believe. Can you give her one? You know, the Lord gave me an assignment about 25 years ago to do a beauty for ashes in it here in Jacksonville. And I had no money. And in the dream was a lady that was working with me, but I didn't know her very well. But she was in my dream, so I went to her and I told her about it. And all I'm going to say is with no money, and we were both working as nurses, God fulfilled a plan for beauty for ashes to for 1,200 women in this city.